Hello, 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 my followers, my friends, my colleagues. How are you doing today? We have a great um, podcast today because uh, Professor Avi Loeb is going to tune in uh, any second now. And we're going to talk about the Galileo project. So what I am very interested in, uh, in is uh, the science behind the UAP research and, you know, finally, um, some scientists are uh, punching in and uh, pulling their weight, finally, on this topic. It's what we're, uh, we're, we've all been waiting for. So I can't wait uh, for uh, Professor Avi Loeb uh, to uh, come in. And uh, you know what? <clears throat> I think he's a... Uh, He's a pioneer because a lot of scientists, they don't dare to take the step to, uh, oh, I think there he is. There is the professor. I'm going to pull him in right now. Hi, Max. Hello, sir. Thank you for joining me. How Hi, are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah. Uh, thank you for for uh, being a, a guest on my podcast. Um, I'm very excited about this. And um, how are you doing, sir? How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Uh, you know, since the pandemic started, I jog every morning at 5 a.m. and in the company of birds, uh, ducks, uh, wild turkeys, and rabbits. And there is even one fox that follows me quite often. And follow that fox. Yeah, that's uh, much more relaxing than dealing with people. I must say. <laughs> Um, and and uh, I think you you live in the the Harvard area, right? Massachusetts, uh, near Boston. Yeah, in a suburb near Boston. Yeah, yeah. It's supposed it's supposedly a, a very beautiful uh, area. So uh, it is beautiful and uh, sort of resembles where I grew up. Uh, I grew up on a farm. I used to have chicken and I used to collect eggs every afternoon and uh, drive a tractor to the hills of the village and read philosophy books. That was my passion back then, and I feel very much connected to nature. So. For example, I get asked whether going to space would be something I would like to do. And the answer is definitely yes, because it's a place where humans uh, never visit. I mean, some of space is, uh, most of space is not, uh, was never visited by humans. And it's an opportunity to go to an unspoiled region where, you know, uh, just in the spirit of Henry Thoreau, you know, uh, close to where I live, there is the Walden Pond. And, uh, Henry Thoreau argued at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution that it's, uh, it makes much more sense for humans to, to pay closer attention to nature and not live in cities. And uh, that's the way I feel about space. Going away uh, from Earth uh, has two advantages, uh, not, uh, uh, not being uh, trapped by groupthink of many other people, uh, by being on your own in space, you know, and uh, exploring new worlds. I think it's a very human thing, you know, it's a, uh, you know, uh, humans are pioneers. We uh, set out to uh, explore and, and, and uh, enhance ourselves. So when we go into space, I think the first thing we need to do is plow the land, make food. Uh, so basically what you are saying, I think it's like, um, if I'm not mistaken, you grew up in Russia and Israel, oh. right? Only no. in Israel, yeah. Only in Israel. Yeah. But can I ask, did you grow up on a kibbutz or a moshav? Or moshav, a... moshav, uh, which yeah. is basically, I mean, it's similar to a kibbutz. In a kibbutz, uh, families share uh, all the property. But uh, in a moshav, uh, each family has its own farm. And, I, you know, we used to have eggs. My father was the head of the pecan and uh, nut factory in, in Israel. And... Um, so, you know, I, I grew up just like a, a farm boy and, uh, but I was mostly fascinated by, um, intellectual, uh, activity and uh, work. And, uh, that was inspired by my mother. Um, uh, and, um, I was attracted to philosophy, but then I had to serve in the military and that, uh, I had two options, either to run on the field uh, with a machine gun attached to me and, or, uh, to actually do some intellectual work for the benefit of, the defense of the country and i was uh, sufficient uh, sufficiently fortunate to be recruited to a program that 
an elite program that uh, recruits uh, 20 to 30 young people at the age of 18 to study physics uh, for the benefit of, of uh, the defense of the country. And I finished my PhD at age 24. Uh, and then I um, um, developed a project that um, uh, was uh, funded by the US and allowed me to visit Washington DC. It was the first international project that was funded by the Star Wars uh, initiative of Ron Ronald Reagan back in the mid 1980s. And um, in one of my visits to the US, I visited Princeton and, and then uh, invited for an, a longer term visit. And then under the condition that I'll switch to astrophysics. And I didn't know anything about how the sun shines or anything. And then um, I was uh, eventually offered a faculty position at Harvard. Um, and tenure three years later um, in uh, uh, 1996. And uh, at that point, I realized that even though it was an arranged marriage, I'm actually married to my true love. Because um, in, in astrophysics, you can ask fundamental philosophical questions like, are we the smartest kid on the block? Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Professor Sababa, <laughs> <laughs> it's a really cool story. Um, so it, it, I love it that you uh, kicked it off with uh, telling a little bit about yourself and how you grew up in Israel on a Moshav, because uh, I'm of Jewish heritage. I've been to Israel many times. I have family in Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, so I kind of know uh, where you're from. And I know that's that it's a very great life, but it's a hard life. Um, and especially when you live on a, on a Moshav, it's hard work, it's farm work. Um, so it's amazing to me that you uh, developed into uh, this scientist and not just a scientist, but maybe uh, one of the most influential scientists of our time. Maybe because what you are doing uh, might uh, change history because you uh, were the first man to address the fact that uh, Uamuma, if, am, am I saying that correct? Oumuamua. Oumuamua, Oumuamua. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, might be uh, something of intelligent, uh, intelligent origins, um, you know, but it, it, there, there's still the you of unidentified in there. Right. Um, but you actually uh, took quite a risk as a scientist because uh, I see this in Holland. Uh, the scientists are very hesitant on addressing, uh, you know, anything that could be intelligent from space how how did this come uh, how did how, when did you decide you were going to speak out about that and um, you know what you have, you have a lot of guts so please walk me through this <laughs> right well if we start from my uh, military service uh, we you know the first 3 months were in the paratroopers and I remember a saying that uh, sometimes a soldier needs to put his body on the barbed wire so Whoa. that others can pass through. And, you know, it's not really about me. Um, it's about um, the future of humanity. And this is a much bigger uh, issue. And I don't mind suffering the pain for the benefit of the, you know, of the younger people that will be able to speak uh, on this subject freely. And I speak what I, I, I regard as the truth. And, uh, you know, the one thing in academia is that uh, you are provided with tenure, and that is supposed to allow you to speak freely um, and, uh, you know, without any concerns about job security. But most of my colleagues, once they get tenure, they start worrying about their image. They do not take risks uh, because they want to get honors and awards and belong to societies. And, you know, that, that is unfortunate because uh, much of the progress in, in science in general is uh, derived from seeing something unusual, something that doesn't quite line up with what you expected. And uh, then you learn something new. It's a dialogue with nature. You listen to nature. You see something that takes you out of your comfort zone. And then you realize something new. And by the way, that's exactly what happened about a century ago when quantum mechanics was discovered based on experiments. And it surprises to me, it's surprising to me that some of my colleagues are not so eager to pay attention to things that do not line up with what they expected. There was a, a seminar at Harvard about Oumuamua. And when I left the room with a colleague of mine that worked on rocks from the solar system, 
yeah. decades, he said, Oumuamua is so weird, I wish it never existed. And that illustrates for you the way that a lot of my colleagues uh, respond to that. And uh, to me, it's actually very exciting and it's an opportunity to learn something new. So the way I approach this subject about Oumuamua, this first interstellar object that we spotted near Earth, that my book Exoterrestrial is about, uh, the way I approached it is very similarly to the way I approached other subjects throughout my career. You know, early in my career as an astrophysicist, I worked on the first stars. You know, it's the scientific version of the story of Genesis and how the first light was produced very early in the universe. And yes, not, many people, not many people were interested. You know, it, it was uh, just a few people around the world. Now it's a mainstream subject. And the telescope that we're about to launch, the James Webb Space Telescope uh, that NASA is about to launch later this year, uh, was designed originally for the purpose of studying the first star. So it's really a mainstream activity right now. It was not when I started to work on it. Uh, and then I worked on imaging black holes, uh, M87, which is a galaxy that was recently imaged just a few a few years ago within the black hole initiative, the, the center that I'm the direct, the founding director of. Um, in, the, in the conference room of this center, we obtained the first uh, image of a black hole based on a paper following a paper that where I suggested to image this specific black hole in M87. And at the time, um, you know, people were also not paying much attention or, or pushing back and saying, what, you know, why is that so interesting? And then um, the same is true about gravitational wave astrophysics. The same is true about the relation between black holes and the galaxies that host them. In all of these frontiers, I made some uh, suggestions that were initially ridiculed or being pushed back, yeah. uh, the nature of dark matter. <clears throat> and I learned over the years not to pay attention to other people, basically advocate for what I think is right. But in any of these instances, I never encountered so much uh, personal attacks, you know, yeah. and, uh, and uh, ridicule and uh, an emotional response and distorting the way uh, that I express myself uh, by scientists. And um, that is something I haven't anticipated. I thought that it's about an intellectual discussion, right? So there is an object that is unusual. I'm putting a possibility on the table that it may be artificial in origin. Other people suggest that it's something that we've never seen before, like a hydrogen iceberg or a nitrogen iceberg or a cloud of dust particles that are very loosely bound. These are things we've never seen before. Okay, so let's put all possibilities on the table and collect more data. But instead, people don't want to even reconsider the possibility of an artificial origin. They ridicule it. They say nasty things about me personally. Yeah. And I don't understand that because it's supposed to be part of the scientific process. The worst thing you can do as a scientist is say, we don't need more data. I know the answer in advance which is pretty much what the philosophers during the days of Galileo Galilei said. We don't need exactly. to use a telescope. We know that the sun moves around the earth. <laughs> well, sir, um, I think you're not the only one. <laughs> um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, UAP UK for your donation. Thank you very much. Um, and, uh, well, you know, of course, uh, you've probably noticed uh, what happened to uh, Mr. Lou Elizondo, who was leading the ATIP program and he had to get the support of his, uh, uh, you know, uh, boss, basically, uh, former Senator Harry, Harry Reid and uh, the support of uh, Mr. Christopher Mellon. Um, you know, these guys really had to step in to show that Mr. Elizondo uh, was who he is, that he did the job he did. Um, so, you know, they try to discredit him. They try to ridicule him. They try to uh, bagatellize uh, whatever he was doing. Um, and you, sir, uh, are maybe one of the first scientists uh, on your, uh, you know, side of the, uh, the history of, of this disclosure part. Uh, are doing some of this work and um, it's it's great you you just address that this is something that is happening to you now my question to you is uh, where do you where do we go from here because you have all this science uh, you've you've studied uh, uh, the the I still can't pronounce it just please help me out <laughs> and um, 
<clears throat> you know, the scientists have so much resistance on, you know, uh, pulling their weight. And, and this is what is so crazy to me. As a scientist, whenever there's something unidentified, your reflex should be, as a scientist, to look what the hell this is. You know, this is what scientists do. Um, so, sir, my hat's off to you. You are doing something other people are not willing to do. They are cowards. I'm saying it, not you. <laughs> so, um, but uh, where do we go from here? I, I would really love to know about the Galileo right. project. So I should tell you, um, there was um, a few weeks ago uh, a scientific paper. By the way, I approached this subject scientifically as a scientist. I'm not uh, a politician, not a military person. Uh, not a national security advisor. For me, it's just a scientific matter. And, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, there was an article in Nature Astronomy magazine where a philosopher said, is Oumuamua artificial or not? And try to bring up philosophical arguments that would rule out an artificial origin. And to me, it reminded again of the philosophers during the days of Galileo. I mean, have we not learned anything? And to me, it's not a philosophical question. <laughs> there is a very simple way to answer this question, and that is to take a high-resolution image. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, right? right. In my case, a picture is worth 66,000 words, the number <laughs> of words in my book. I wouldn't need to write the book if we had a high-resolution image of a muamua because we would be able to tell from this image whether it's an artificial object or a rock. Even if it's a hydrogen iceberg or a nitrogen iceberg, we would tell, you know, it, it would look strange. And by the way, all these suggestions made by scientists that took into attention, took into consideration the unusual properties of a muamua, uh, all of them contemplated something we've never seen before. So my point is, let's get that image. Let's collect more data so that we can get the answer. And the same about UAP, I should say. Um, so I approach, I think that the, Pentagon report, the, the uh, ODNI report to Congress, uh, right. was sufficiently intriguing for scientists to get engaged. This subject should move away from the talking points of politicians, national security advisors, just for the same reason that you wouldn't ask a plumber to bake you a cake, right? These people <laughs> are, not, yes. are not trained uh, in science, uh, so why should we ask them to interpret things we see on the sky? You know, that's the job of astronomers. Astronomers look yes. at the sky and try to figure it out. So here is my proposal. Let's use, let's build new telescopes that use new cameras. By the way, all of them can be bought off the shelf. Uh, I, just the other day, I was searching online, I found, you know, a one meter telescope, there is a website that sells it and you can click on add to the bag. You know, there is this icon where you can <laughs> add to the bag. It's like half, half like Amazon. <laughs> yeah, it's half a million dollars for one meter telescope. There must be people that are willing to pay half a million dollars and add that telescope to their bag. Uh, I, you know, I don't have such a big bank account, but at any event, you can buy instruments, telescopes, and then put them together and, and place them in the appropriate locations with appropriate instrumentation, connect them to a camera that fits the data. There is a huge data stream that will come through this video that you're taking of the sky, and it has to be filtered by a computer system. So you can put all of this together by a group of astronomers that I uh, assembled as part of this, uh, the Galileo project. And right. by the way, it's called Galileo because of the experience that I mentioned before of the philosophers not willing to look through telescopes. My right. point is, let's build new telescopes and look through them rather than let's not repeat the same mistake, right? I love it. And, um, so astronomers can look at the sky and figure it out. Now, all of the existing telescopes that astronomers are using are looking at distant objects, you know, right. objects far away that have no consequence to our daily life. Most of the time, you know. Right. The point here is, you know, and and for the conventional. I think I think I know where you're getting at because, like, in in the in our closer space, there's a lot to see. Maybe we're looking too far. Is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. And it's very <laughs> different search. You might say, why isn't the data already available? Because it's a different search strategy, right? If if a right. bird 
uh, flies above your telescope. You know, the, the astronomers would just dismiss it. If they see an airplane, they just dismiss it. Uh, so because they are looking farther away. But if you have a project aimed at looking at UAP, nearby objects, the search strategy is quite different. These objects move uh, a lot across the sky. You might also look for more and more like objects and study them more carefully. So altogether, uh, the way I see it is that Oumuamua was pretty much a wake-up call. It's an object that didn't look like a comet right. or an asteroid. And I, I wrote a book about it. We didn't I have know. enough evidence. But, but, but now, uh, Professor, uh, let, let's rewind a little bit. Uh, for the people who don't know too much about Oumuamua, um, what particularly caught your attention about that uh, moving uh, phenomenon in the in the universe in the in the in the in space? Yeah, what caught your attention? What what made you think this is moving intelligently? And um, as a scientist, walk me through this, please. Right. So. Um... Oumuamua was the first object that came from outside the solar system the, that we identified close to Earth in 2017, October 19, 2017. It yes, was sir. discovered by a telescope in Hawaii, and uh, hence the name uh, Oumuamua, which means in the Hawaiian language, a scout, a messenger from far away. It was the very first object that did not originate in the solar system that we saw near us. Okay, right, and that is through a survey of the sky that was not intended to find such objects, because actually a decade earlier, the reason I was interested in this object is a decade earlier, I wrote the first paper forecasting how many rocks do we expect from systems like the solar system around other stars, right? right. So you can ask, given what we know about the solar system, there should be a population of rocks that are ejected from other stars, and we would see one or two of them, you know, coming through every now and then. And um, and so the question was how frequently and would this telescope in Hawaii, pan stars, see any of them? So we did the calculation and we argued, no, you won't see any of them with pan stars. And uh, then Oumuamua was discovered. So that was a big surprise. And by the way, we uh, expected them not to be find, found by orders of magnitude. So if you want to explain Oumuamua, you need somewhere between 100 to 100 million times more objects than we anticipated being floating in space. So that's the first thing that caught my attention. Here is an object that I did not expect to be found. And, you know, that's quite interesting. And then, uh, of course, I assumed like all the other astronomers, I had no prejudice, no uh, agenda. I was not working in the field of SETI, searching for extraterrestrial intelligence in any way. So I expected this to be a rock. But then it wasn't a comet. You know, usually you find comets, uh, you would expect to find comets because they are the most loosely bound objects in the solar system. They are sort of in the periphery, so-called Oort cloud. And it's very easy to um, kick them out of the solar system. Uh, and so you expect those to be most common from other stars, just, you know, uh, left other stars and came to us because they were at the periphery of, of their planetary system. But there was no cometary tail. A comet is just a rock covered with ice. And right. when the rock gets close to the sun, the ice evaporates and you get a tail of or, or some, some surrounding gas plus dust. And that's scattered sunlight. So uh, you can see it visually. You see a cometary tail very, very clearly. There wasn't something like that. And in fact, the Spitzer Space Telescope looked very deeply around this object, didn't find any traces of carbon-based molecules or dust. So it was definitely not a comet of the type that we have seen before. So then the astronomers say, OK, maybe it's just bare rock, no ice on the surface. Right. Uh, but then the strange thing, as it was tumbling, uh, the amount of light reflected from it, the amount of sunlight. And by the way, we use the sun as a lamppost that illuminates the darkness around us. So when an object comes the size of a football field comes close, it reflects sunlight and we see it. That's the way we see such an object. But as it was tumbling, the amount of light reflected from it changed by a factor of 10. And that meant that it has a very extreme shape uh think about a piece of paper tumbling in the wind right see the amount of area changing by 10 it means the piece of paper is very thin and yeah. that's and in fact this object had to 
most likely based on the light variation had to be flat, pancake shaped. And um, moreover, it exhibited an excess push away from the sun. And I interpreted that to mean that it's, reflect, it's reflecting sunlight. And as a result, it's being pushed by sunlight. And that was completely consistent with the fact that the amount of force that was acting on it declined inversely with distance squared in a smooth fashion, as you expect from reflection of sunlight. And, uh, and you know, for that, the object had to be very thin in order for the sunlight to be effective. And nature doesn't make very thin objects like a light sail. Um, and actually, in September 2020, there was another object discovered by the same telescope. It was given oh. the name 2020 SO. Oh, it was whoa, 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 back up, back up. <laughs> yeah. There was another object, 2020. Uh, I, I haven't heard about it. Is this known? Yes, it, there is a Wikipedia page. Check out uh, 2020 SO. Let okay. me, uh, then you will realize why you didn't hear about it. So this object also exhibited an excess push from the sun by reflecting sunlight, no right. cometary tail. But then when people uh, extrapolated the orbit back in time, they realized, oh, it actually came from Earth. Uh, it's actually a rocket booster from a 1966 launch of oh. the lunar lander mission. Okay. And we produced it, <laughs> but it was floating <laughs> in space since 1966. Now, wow. we know that it had very thin walls. Yeah. And as a result, it had a large area for its mass. So it could have right. been pushed by, but it was not a light sail. It was not designed to be a sail pushed by light. And so, you know, here is an example of an object that we produced artificially. Yeah. That's so this, this was ba basically a good benchmark uh, for the 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 Uamuma Oumuma, and, yeah. Yeah. and uh, <laughs> so sorry and uh whatever this human produced um uh, object what, what which was uh, floating through space so now you can compare those two to each other yes and, and, and more importantly it shows you that a thin object was not ne is not necessarily a light sail. It's not meant to be a light sail. So that led me, when the UAP report uh, to Congress uh, came from the Pentagon, uh, and, and they basically uh, acknowledged the existence of objects whose nature they don't understand. They, they argue that these are real objects. It led me to the conjecture that maybe Oumuamua was not a light sail, but actually a very thin structure uh, that was meant to be a receiver, you know, so it was tumbling to collect data from probes that were previously uh, left in the solar system a long time ago. And, you know, maybe that was its purpose. We don't know. We don't have enough data. So my point is very simple. There would be more objects like Oumuamua that we will discover in the future. In a couple of years, the Vera Rubin Observatory will be much more sensitive than pan stars, and we will see more of the same. And right. when we see an object approaching us a year in advance, let's say, we can send a spacecraft equipped with a camera that will intercept its trajectory and take a close-up photograph. You know, just like Osiris-Rex uh, took a close-up photograph of the yeah. asteroid Bennu and actually landed on its surface and scooped some material that it will bring back to Earth in much the same way. I have one more question about Oumuamua, yes. um, and it's about the behavior of uh, the object. So what I understood, uh, the object was moving like uh, tumbling. tumbling, like tumbleweed, but like in, in different ways, but also vibrating at the same time. Is that true? Um, well, we, we don't know exactly its shape to, uh, and we don't know the reflectance from its surface. Uh, but we're sure it's it, it was tumbling like this, right? We're sure it was tumbling, and most likely, at the 90% confidence, it had a flat shape. And by the way, these conclusions were not derived by me. Other people, other astronomers concluded that. Yet... Yeah, this is em em empirical research. Empirical. It's standard yeah. uh, scientific analysis. But when I see such weird properties, I say, okay, let's contemplate the possibility it's artificial. And then my yeah. colleagues just go after me and say, no way, this cannot be, any, you know, and they ridicule it. And I find that strange. Not, why not leave it on the table as a possibility and then collect more data in the future? Why is it so controversial? 
Now, for example, just to give you an example, we don't know what most of the matter in the universe is. We call it dark matter. Okay, right. that's part of... Okay, and by the way, cosmologists are getting paid even though they don't know what most of the matter in the universe is. You might find that <laughs> yeah. strange because they, that's their job, right? But right. for decades now, four decades, we are searching for specific types of, dark, of particles making the dark matter. So like weakly interacting massive particles, Hundreds of millions of dollars were dedicated to those searches. We haven't found it yet. We just put limits, ruling out possibilities. And that is part of the mainstream. If someone tells you, I'm searching for weakly interacting massive particles as a dark matter, nobody ridicules that. And uh, I asked once at a conference, I asked uh, one of the leaders in this field, I said, okay, you've been searching for decades. You didn't find it. How much longer will you continue to search for it? And he said, as long as I'm getting funded. So my point is, this is mainstream, right? To search right. for something we haven't found, we don't know if it exists. Why would the search for technological relics, which I call space archaeology, here is an object that looks weird, Oumuamua, that should trigger our excitement, our interest. Let's go out and search for plastic bottles among all the rocks that we see very often. Just like walking on the beach, most of the time you see rocks. Every now and then you see a plastic bottle that was artificially produced. Why not do that? It, to me, it makes complete sense. The public is excited about it. So guess what? If the public is excited, we can get more funds to science this way. We exactly. can get more young kids to become scientists. And yet the scientists do not want it. They just say, forget about it. Now, it's, I don't understand. It's a win-win proposition. We might learn something new about our place in the universe. We exactly. might get much more funds to astronomy. We might get many more people engaged in science. And yet, the scientific community, which is supposed to benefit the most from this prospect, yeah. is pushing back. And I was trying to make this point and ask people, why don't you join me in this, in this endeavor? Why don't you try to get excited and, and move on. Let's get, collect more data on objects. It's a wake up call. So, so, so right. sir, let, 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 me, let me ask you this. Um, you are starting uh, this, this movement, right? Um, and by the way, my hats off to you. I, I, I love it. I think everyone who's watching this, you know, we've been waiting for this, for, for scientists to pull their weight finally. Um, but let me ask you this. Uh, is there already some, um, let's say, uh, literature on, on, on the topic, you know, uh, in, in a, in a uh, scientific magazine? Are you already writing? And now my follow-up question, I'm going to ask it right off the bat. Um, you must have been researching. Uh, I know there's something, going, uh, there's something going to be released maybe tomorrow or today. I'm not sure. Tomorrow. Can we have a tip of that, of the iceberg, please? Right. So uh, <laughs> first about scientific publications, you know, uh, I have a link on my website at Harvard that uh, uh, lists all the papers that I've written on, on Muamua, scientific papers that were published in respectable journals. Actually, the first one was accepted for publication within three days. That was a record for me. The referees were actually saying that's a great idea. And then the scientific community at large was uh, starting to push back immediately as it was published. Uh, right. I have a lot of scientific papers on the subject. In fact, I finished a textbook of 800 pages published a week ago by Harvard University Press. It's called Life in the Cosmos, and it's a textbook for researchers. Mazel tov. On, uh, thank you. On the search both for primitive life, microbial life, and the search for intelligent life. And so my goal is to bring it to the mainstream. And, um, and so what happened was quite remarkable that, you know, every week or so I write um, a commentary in Scientific American. And then two weeks ago, I get an email from uh, the administrator of the astronomy department where I belong at Harvard. Right. And he says, uh, you have a new research fund. And I say, what do you mean I have a new research fund? Could you please explain uh, where the money came from? <laughs> and he said, well, you know, the development office at Harvard that, that collects uh, donations um, just sent me this note. 
And I say, okay, but uh, you realize that, you know, it's very polite of me to thank the person who gave me the money. I mean, that that is the appropriate thing to do. I'm not asking for anything unusual here. I'm just so saying. So you had a anonymous benefit, bene benefactor? Uh, yes, so someone decided to donate a substantial amount of money to my research account, no strings attached. And so I asked, okay, but, you know, please let me know the name of that person so that I can thank him. And they sent me that name and I thanked him and I spoke with him uh, over Zoom. Uh, Who was it? And then there was another Who was it? published contact, uh, multi-billionaire that said, uh, I have some questions about your book. Okay. So I should say that I, I since I published uh, Extraterrestrial... Can I, uh, can I ask you one question? Is he no. Russian? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, um, uh, uh, since I published my book six months ago, um, it was translated it, it was translated to 25 languages and became bestseller in many countries. And I had about a thousand interviews for podcasts, for television, radio, and newspapers and so forth. And... Uh, it was all possible because of the pandemic, because I had back-to-back -back interviews for most of the days over the past six months. And uh, so some wealthy individuals uh, read my book, listened to my podcast, and said, that makes sense. Um, we would like to support it. So that person came to, my, to the porch of my home, and we had a conversation. He asked me some questions, and then he said, I'm happy to provide funds to support. Uh, and so altogether, over the past two weeks, uh, I received um, $1.755 million from people that I've never known before. Wow. And then I said, okay, that's, that's real money. What <laughs> do we do with it to promote the cause? You know, I'm not interested in it for my personal benefit. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, then uh, I decided to assemble a team of astronomers first class uh, to study objects near Earth that could be potentially affected. So if I, if I get you right, the Galileo project is basically funded with that money. Yes. And we will discuss all the details about the Galileo project. I just wanted to give you a teaser because tomorrow uh, at noon Eastern time, uh, we will have a press conference discussing this project and it's open yes. to everyone and you can find the links to that press conference the youtube link and the facebook link on the galileo project website at harvard university so i will, I will make sure I will, I will put it on the feed in the feed uh after this uh broadcast uh but sir, this is incredible news. And and by by the way, Mazel Tov, congratulations Thank you. Uh, on on your uh, support and the financial endorsement. I should, um, I should say just a comment about that, a footnote, that if I get ten times more money, uh, I think we can do a, a much more thorough and rigorous study of the subject. So yes, although we have enough money to demonstrate that we can get uh, very high quality data. I think 10 times more would basically get it done at a high level. Okay, so everybody, everyone who's viewing this, you know, endorse Mr. Professor Avi Loeb and his uh, uh, research work. It's so important. Uh, you know, he's doing divine work. Um, and I see my friends, uh, Sean and Vinny, coming in. Guys, I will get let you in in 10 minutes, but I need to ask uh, Mr. Uh, Loeb a couple of more questions. Um, so, sir, uh, tomorrow there's going to be the, 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 the press release uh, on the Galileo project. Is there already something you guys uh, recovered or, or, or found out? Uh, is there something new? Already? No, you, you, you have to realize this, is all, uh, this was all assembled over the past few weeks. Uh, it's, right. uh, we didn't have enough time, but we plan to hit the ground running because we know we have... We have exceptional instrumentalists on the team, and we are cu currently converging with what kind of instruments we would like to use. Um, and uh, then we will purchase those instruments because I have the money. Uh, it's not a it's not a theoretical nice. discussion, uh, yeah. so we can get going. And then, of course, one has to test 
those instruments and start deploying them uh, once they are ready to go and start collecting the data. Of course, there is a very important component to all of this, and it, it's the software that one is using, artificial intelligence, uh, to filter out the objects of interest, because there is a huge amount of data that you collect from looking, you know, having a very uh, extended video of the sky, um, and you cannot, you cannot store that anywhere uh, on the okay. cloud. You have to filter out objects of interest. You have to uh, dismiss birds, uh, airplanes, <laughs> uh, <Loki. laughs> drones, or anything else. Now, my point is, every time you look at the sky with a, a, a new set of eyes, you know, a new set of instruments, you're likely to find something new. And I would be happy, even if we understand all the UAP as some atmospheric, exotic atmospheric phenomena that was not recognized in the past, you know, that would be a new knowledge that we gained. And uh, uh, so it's a win-win uh, situation where by collecting evidence, we can always learn something new. And um, I think that, you know, just it could be more informative about our immediate environment than so far the search for dark matter was. We haven't found the dark matter. We have been doing it for, you know, four decades. We used hundreds of millions of dollars in that search. And that's part of the mainstream. So I believe this subject should be part of the mainstream as well. Wow. Look, I, I, I am so excited for what you guys are about to research and, and, and about to find out. But uh, if, if, if I'm clear what, with what you are looking at, you just want to research what is in our atmosphere you know uh you're looking at signature um wh what are you looking at is it signature well, is it is it uh no, it, sorry so it we are looking at objects near earth which could be right. Oumuamua like that came from interstellar space or objects that are just around uh, and classified as uh, uap unidentified aerial phenomena so right. it's like a Think of it as a fishing expedition, okay? You're going out fishing. You shouldn't assume that you know what you will find, right? What kind of fish you will find. The mistake made very often is, oh, we, you know, there is, I'm most likely to find this kind of fish and another type of fish. I, I'm completely agnostic. And by the way, I'm a theoretical astrophysicist. I'm not an observer. I'm not an instrumentalist. But to me, being agnostic is a great benefit because yeah. when you are limiting uh, your discoveries, uh, it's sort of like putting blinders on a horse. The horse doesn't see sideways. If you decide that you are looking for something specific, you don't find things that you haven't expected. And I can, well, give, yeah, yeah. But my question is basically, what what data are you looking to collect? Are you okay. looking? Well, it's. Uh, uh, yeah, it's imaging um, for UAP, for example, uh, the telescopes will image the sky. Right. So we're trying to collect data on the sky that mm -hmm. is open and subject to a transparent analysis, scientific analysis. So you see, most of the data collected by the government is classified, not because the data itself necessarily has to be classified, it's because it was taken with sensors that are used for national security purposes, to monitor the sky over the U.S., for example. Right. And the government will not release the data because otherwise it would reveal the quality or the type of instruments being used uh, to monitor the sky over the U.S. And this is something the government would not disclose because it can be used for the benefit of adversaries. Now, my question to you, to you is, as a scientist, are you using any systems that are maybe still classified? Uh, no. Do you have so, no. so my, my point is I prefer not to look at classified data whatsoever because once you do that, then uh, that puts restrictions on what you can say. Right. And that also puts restrictions on what you can study. And there is always this uh, uh, limitation because suppose I know something, but I'm also engaged in a scientific project. You know, the, the people that told me that something may always suspect that I'm using the information, even though I'm talking about something else, I'm using the information right. even subconsciously. So I better not know. And by the way, 
the way that science operates is by reproducing evidence, not by relying on all the evidence that someone told you about. Right. Um, the idea is, and also I should tell you that uh, the reports that appeared, okay, on UFOs that we saw, like the videos of, you know, they were obtained by a jittery camera on a fighter jet. And yeah. you don't know exactly the trajectory of the fighter jet. You don't know the conditions that the camera was in. And, uh, you know, that is unacceptable as scientific evidence because you have to have full control over your instruments. And you should rely on, by the way, on instruments, not on humans, uh, because humans can have hallucinations. Humans can have, uh, you know, they... Uh, they uh, yes, they, yes, I, they, I, I agree. I agree. But, you know, when we talk about uh, the footage that was obtained, it's not just one observant, it's multiple, and it's right. multiple radar data. That's, and, that's why, that's why I, I want to study it, because it's intriguing enough. But you cannot write a scientific paper saying this pilot said that, and therefore this object is of these properties. Look, Mr. Loeb, <laughs> I commend you. I can't wait for your science to... Uh, you know, uh, get alongside with this footage, with this ra the, the radar data, or even the, sig uh, the secret uh, signature uh, systems. But um, let me introduce you to some of my uh, colleagues. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I see them uh, wagging their tails. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let me start with Mr. S Sean Rush. Here you go. Hi, Avi. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good, and, good. And uh, uh, Sean's from the, the, the USA. And here's my UK colleague, uh, Mr. Vinny Adams. Hi, guys. Hi, Professor Loeb. Nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see I, you, I, I, like, I like your accent. Oh, mine, <laughs> oh <mine> thank you. <laughs> well, the British accent always sounds much more intelligent. Oh, well, thank oh. you very much for ah, showing yeah. us up again, right Vinny. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. If I may jump in... Um, I've just put together, I've just been going through the, the Harvard website and looking at the Galileo project. And what really stood out for me, Professor, was um, you're looking at building or putting together these arrays that are across different locations um, for things that are a bit closer to, to Earth. And that automatically set off in my mind the work that's being do done by Skyhub, which is the civilian owned center okay. arrays. Oh, are you yeah. So um, I got an email from uh, the head uh, of uh, Sky Hub. Right. And he's coming to the porch of my home tomorrow after the press conference, and we will meet because he lives nearby. Well, that answers wow. your question. I would very much like to know more about Sky Hub, and perhaps we can collaborate. But I have to hear the details from him. Sure, that's fantastic. That, that answered my question straight away. Um, one, <laughs> yeah. of, w one other thing I just wanted to mention as well is that the first avenue that the, it talks about on the website is, you know, megapixel images. Um, so uh, well, we really are just talking that you are looking to photograph UAP, you uh, know. Let, let, let me explain uh, the, the rationale behind it. Basically, if you have an object the size of a person, okay, at a distance of a kilometer, okay, um, if, uh, and you want to get a megapixel image of that object, all you need is a one meter telescope. Uh, yeah. Just uh, conventional optics will tell you that it will allow you to get a resolution of one millimeter on the surface of this object. So right. that would allow you to read, it's the size of the head of a pin. It will allow you to tell the difference between made in country X <laughs> to made on planet Y. Sure. You know, you can read off the label. So my point is, if you have such a megapixel image, we are done. I don't need to argue with philosophers. <laughs> <laughs> I would just show this image and say, that's it. You know, and whoever doesn't believe in the, you know, the data must be crazy because, you know, it was obtained in a scientific way using scientific instruments. Of course. If you say, I need extraordinary evidence before I even discuss this subject, and then you don't fund the subject and you ridicule it, then it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. And my point is, you know, we can close off the curtains on our windows and say, oh, we don't have any neighbors and we are the smartest in the universe. But that I will not that get rid of our neighbors. <laughs> wow. No, that's great. Fabulous. Thank you. Yeah. Um, sure. And then... 
Yeah. Yeah. Go on, Sean. <laughs> well, I, I guess the the first thing, you know, a lot, and this kind of goes without saying, but um, in this at this exact time, right now in this topic, and with everything surrounding it, um, pressures in different um, areas of the world, um, a lot of people are looking to you um, with massive amounts of hope and i'm sure that you feel that pressure um no not at all no <laughs> what what do you do what do you do to manage that and stay focused because i'm sure it's that, not that easy. is completely um it doesn't affect me a bit i mean i enjoy as i said before uh, jogging every morning and i pretty much uh, i don't care how many likes i have on twitter you know i don't what? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how many dislikes uh, and so my point is i'm just trying to convey a message that would appeal to the public because i don't feel elevated you know i don't feel that i'm on a pedestal just because i'm a professor at harvard i feel like sure. the common like anyone else you know you're I, just showing off professor Lope. <laughs> no 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 when i mean uh, you can ask my wife i mean when a plumber comes to fix something at home you know we spend hours sitting on on the, the stairs and talking and you know the plumber often tells me about his life and uh, her hair uh, and um, uh, so um, I don't feel at all as if um, science uh, puts you on a pedestal I feel it's a way of life and it's just paying at basically it's paying attention to evidence and not being biased exactly. okay and uh, I was asked uh, how do you define an intelligent culture and I say <laughs> Uh, I define it as a culture, as a civilization that is guided by the principles of science, meaning cooperation and sharing of evidence-based knowledge. And if you look at human history, we're not cooperating with each other. A lot of people want to feel superior relative to each other. And that includes the academic community, you mm -hmm. know, superior but, uh, and uh, also, you know, uh, people fight each other and so forth. Makes very little sense. Uh, especially if you, if, if you imagine that there is a, a, an intelligent species out there because our differences are completely insignificant. Mm -hmm. uh, but then also people do not base their knowledge on evidence very often. Mm -hmm. And that includes also people in academia, I must say, right. uh, because you, know, you have a community of theoretical physicists talking about the multiverse, about extra dimensions, about string theory landscape. There is no evidence for that. And when people ask me, what do you mean? Uh, why is it so essential? You know, maybe it will be found 100 years from now, 200 years from now. My answer is very simple. Bernie Madoff. So mm. Bernie Madoff told people <laughs> that if they give him their money, then he will bring give them back more money he did, irrespective didn't he? of what the stock market does. <laughs> now, that was a beautiful idea. It, the people... <laughs> found it so beautiful that they gave him the money. What else could be a better testimony? <laughs> you know, uh, so they gave him the money. He was happy that they gave him the money. They were happy. Oh, my God. Until when? Until they did the experiment, when they asked him for the money back. And then he was put in jail. So my question is, how do we tell if an idea that looks beautiful to all of us, such as the multiverse or such as, you know, whatever I mentioned before, how do we know whether it's real or not Science, by yeah. experimental evidence? Otherwise, it may be a Ponzi scheme. And the fact that uh, scientists do not regard that as a necessary ingredient, they can spend a career without experimental feedback, to me is disappointing because you know we live for such a short time. Why waste all that time on uh, yeah, speculation that cannot be tested? Now, yeah. the stability of an extraterrestrial civilization is very real because we know that half of the sun-like stars have a planet the size of the earth roughly at the same separation and there are tens of billions of systems like that in the milky way so how dare we say give me extraordinary evidence before actually considering this possibility i mean yeah. it's it's a, co a matter of common sense if you go to a person on the street you know it, that person will tell you that it makes sense to search for things like us because conditions are similar on so many sure. other planets. And in fact, they predated us perhaps because most of the stars formed before the sun. So my point is, I'm just using my common sense and I don't know, the only reason that you are speaking- Well, your common sense went to Harvard, so. Well, the only reason, <laughs> the only reason you are speaking to me is because 
my colleagues are not using the same logic because otherwise I would much rather be in a situation where everyone says what I'm saying. Now, sir, can you can you maybe elaborate on that a little bit? So, so what is the discre uh, discrepancy between uh, the way you approach this topic and your colleagues? So, so where does this collide? Yeah, so I think, uh, well, part of the reason is that my colleagues prefer to be conservative. You know, some of my colleagues prefer to be conservative, not take risks not to put their skin in the game because they want to protect their image and not get into controversy. And then they find discussions in the public that make no sense to them. But my, my uh, response to that is, if you go back a thousand years, there were people saying the human body has a soul and therefore anatomy should be forbidden. And just imagine scientists saying, this subject is controversial. Some people say nonsense about the human body and therefore... We don't want to be controversial. We don't want to deal with anatomy. Where would modern medicine be if we didn't, you know, uh, uh, conduct operations on the human body? My point is, if scientists have the tools to address a subject, even though other people say nonsense about yeah. it, uh, we should address it. And uh, especially if it's of great interest to the public, because the public funds science. So I'm just paying attention to what Everyone is talking about and saying, okay, let's explore it in a scientific way. What's the problem with that? And there's so many lives that have been affected by this uh, in not such a positive way, whether it's stigma when reporting it or uh, other situations. Um, and that's gone on as long as we've known about a possibility of flying saucers, basically. Um, so it's, it, you know, it... It's unfortunate, but I'm happy that there's finally somebody like yourself that stands up. And I know you don't want to put yourself on a pedestal, so I'll just do it for you. <laughs> but that stands up and, and takes this work on because it's it's very noble uh, to do something different, you know, that, that will, you know, have people chastise you for it and to do it anyways. Well, um, I'm doing it just so. because I, I'm a, fundamentally I'm a farm boy. And I don't, I don't have any social media footprint. You see, that <laughs> these are the two ingredients you have to keep in mind. That I don't care what yeah. other people say. That that is irrelevant. And I also, you know, fundamentally, am connected to nature. So I, I pay respect to nature. But if I see something unusual, I talk about it. Now, the fact that my colleagues ridicule that, I don't care less. That's the you know, professor. Can I? Can I? Uh, what intrigues me? Uh, what you just said about uh, I'm I'm in, in contact with nature. To me, uh, that's Kabbalah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here's Max with his Kabbalah again. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going. I'm, I'm going kidding. Kabbalah on your butt. Sorry, Sean. <laughs> But Kabbalah means, uh, you know, everything is connected. You know, there, there's energy is connected uh, in the universe between human beings, etc. Uh, even the James Cameron film Avatar uh, with the, the Tree of Life, it's Kabbalah. Now, I'm going to... Uh, He's got a big old smile. He's going to say, where's the evidence? No, 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 no. I, w I would actually uh, agree. With, uh, let me just make a footnote to what you just said. That sure, um, you know, uh, humans developed all kinds of religions, uh, and um, uh, God is often, um, uh, you know, has qualities that um, we thought are superhuman. But if you look at science, we are currently getting to a point where we might create life in the laboratory, you know, synthetically out of a soup of chemicals. And uh, that is a, uh, used to be a divine entity. So my point is uh, an advanced form of science and technology uh, could appear to us as magic and as if it's godlike and um, therefore, as you say, everything may be connected. You know, it's possible that life in various places was uh, seeded by some advanced technology. There you go, Sean. <laughs> Did you hear that? Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to hear it because I can't it? handle it. It's overwhelming. Yeah, Thanks. Yes. <laughs> it's very interesting. <laughs> now, don't you dare look in my eyes. Ever right, last again. question. Oh. Do you play chess? Me? No. Yeah. No? No. Darn it. Okay. <laughs> That's it. Uh, and by the way, um, I was for nine years, I was the chair of the astronomy department at Harvard. And if you ask, I mean, this is three terms. It was the longest uh, ter uh, service of a department chair. Wow. And um, 
uh, when I started, my wife said I would not last very long because mm -hmm. I basically, I never manipulate people. I speak my mind and um, turned out to be a great benefit because people then do not suspect that you manipulate them, do not worry about a hidden agenda. And that led to three terms, you know, the longest serving chair. And so that is my approach on anything. Now, what you see is what you get, and I'm not pretending or not uh, trying to manipulate anyone. And therefore, playing chess for me is not a skill that I'm necessarily using. You know, I'm not trying to play several uh, steps sure. ahead and, and, and win the game against someone. I'm just trying to understand things better. That's all. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Sir? Based on data collection on, on, what you, well. on what you just said, I think you might have become my personal new, my new personal hero. Yes. <laughs> just say, just say whatever comes to mind, whatever you believe in, whatever you feel, uh, speak out, you know, what, what is your passion? What is your, your, your beliefs? And stand right in front of that. I love it. Thank you, Mr. The Lowe. irony is that someone like yourself can get to a level of success that you have. And that same mentality that Max just touched on is one that, you know, Little Richard had, you know, <laughs> or Jimmy Page or, you know, somebody who put all that work into their craft. Now, Mr. Loeb, I have to warn you, Sean is a musician. Okay. <laughs> so I should tell it's you a common the theme. Over the past few months, I spoke to a lot of artists and musicians. Uh, actually, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a podcast with uh, King Princess. I don't know if you know her. Uh, oh, no. Very young, uh, quite popular uh, pop singer. But oh, uh, wow. I really enjoyed uh, speaking to artists because um, it, it led me to recognize the fact that the creative work in the arts is not very different from creative work in science, uh, of course, it's using different tools. Sure. Just like a painter is using different the medium tools than a, a musician. And but but um, there is an aspect to creative work where you know things come to you uh, in a way that you cannot prescribe. You cannot give a recipe for that. But it uh, it basically takes advantage of everything that you experience, mm -hmm. and um, it it just comes out in you know um, out of nowhere, so to speak, and in, in, in through inspiration and. Um, yeah. Since I wrote a book, you know, which is a form of art, mm -hmm. I pretty much know both ways, you know, of writing, literature, and, and, and also science. And to me, you know, both of them uh, have a lot in common. And, and I don't, again, I don't think that science is superior to the humanities in any way uh, or to th philosophy, for example. And a lot of people that are engaged in the humanities have a, an inferiority complex. And mm -hmm. uh, one of them told me, oh, if uh, physicists agree on something for 10 years, it must be right. And I said, how can you say something like that? You know, because physics is based on evidence. And, you know, a group of physicists may agree on some notion that turns out to be wrong, just like people that gave money to, to uh, you know, <laughs> to a Ponzi scheme. And yeah. uh, so my point is, philosophers should not have any, any, an inferiority complex. The same is true for artists because they are doing something as valuable as science. It, it's just a different way of looking at reality. Right. I see it as kind of unique to the person who does it, right? Yeah. It reflects on your qualities, the way you look yeah. at reality. But the other thing is, you know, when you witness, a, look at a building, you know, the, the physicist will just break it down to the bricks that make the building and try to figure out what makes the building and how they are held together. Whereas uh, an architect would look at the building and try to figure out the blueprint. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that is a very different uh, way of looking at the building because you're not looking at the composition of the building or what kind of forces are holding it together, but more about the concept. What, you know, what does it represent? And, and to me, that's the difference between uh, physics and the humanities or the arts. You yeah. can look at reality in different ways mm -hmm. and none of these ways is superior to the others. It's just complementary. And, and yeah. I think the people that are engaged in those different ways of looking at reality should be respected as much. Uh, I don't see any anything more valuable in, in the way that science looks at reality. Well, I, I, I do think that uh, scientists like Thank yourself, you. sir, um, that your cre creativity is something that I think is so important. And, and if you think outside of the box and you look for different angles to approach the subject, you know, think in a different way, you, you might come up with 
uh, something that you know might be so important in 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 the later phase of of the research, uh, and and you know disclosing whatever is going on right here. Exactly. That's what, I, that's what I find interesting. These three avenues that you're looking at with Galileo Project, and you know, if you were to sort of start getting the data in, and you find something. Um, like a UAP, will you be speaking to government groups such as the UAP task force or anything like that? Well, it depends on uh, what the nature of this object is. If it belongs to another government, foreign nation, they should know about it. But uh, if it's just an object that came from another planet, you know, I think the public deserves to know about it as quickly as anyone else. Would you, I do. That, would you put that information out before going to the government? Sure. I mean, I don't see why science should be... Look, if, if we observe a supernova explosion, uh, would we first ask the government whether to write a paper about it? Mm. No. Uh, even, if I... it, even if it happens nearby, you know, that there is some risk to humanity, immediately you will report about it to the scientific community. And, you know, science is about an open exchange of information. And that's pretty much the nature of this project. Now, of course, if the object is of national security concern because another nation possesses a technology we've never imagined, that's a completely different matter. You know, sure. that's not a scientific matter. That, mm. That's more a policy matter. And yeah. that's where politicians should be notified before anyone else. Yeah. But uh, if it's um, just of, you know, uh, some uh, astronomical uh, um, origin, you know, then, then of course it will be open to everyone. Um, and I should say that's the novelty of the project that uh, I brought together scientists with, uh, you know, and, and astronomers mostly uh, with no um, connection to the government. Right. Now, sir, I, I do think uh, the, the government, uh, the DOD, is in dire need of scientists, you know, uh, uh, helping them out because, you know, they, they have all this data, they have all this footage, they need you, they need your team. Well, actually, uh, actually the head of NASA, Bill Nelson, mm -hmm. appeared on yeah. CNN uh, around the time when the Pentagon report came out and, uh, and said that now is the time for scientists to get engaged. Now, Definitely. I haven't seen any, um, anything from the people under him that uh, reflects uh, his words and so I decided to establish this uh, project. Um, I hope he will pay attention to this project and hopefully, you know, get uh, engaged as well. But uh, because NASA does fund scientific projects and uh, uh, I would be delighted if he were to support us. Well, my viewers, Mill Bill Nelson, this podcast right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he said something interesting, actually. He talked about um, but there are some moons um, that kind of resemble, you know, similarities as our atmosphere that have oceans. And if there's oceans, there is life. And when I heard that, I, you know, it, it just hit, like, why... You know, if we can exist, something else can too. Right. Yeah. I mean, in the solar system, there are uh, there is, for example, Enceladus or Europa. Uh, these are moons that uh, have an icy surface, and we see geysers coming off the cracked ice, cracks in the ice, and uh, it's quite likely that there is an ocean under the ice. And the question is, are there fish in that ocean or any, <laughs> any other, you know, like bacteria? And we don't know yet. Uh, that's a place to explore. But I should say, um, searching for microbial life it is part of the mainstream, and we are doing it on Mars right now. Yeah, there's fungus on Mars. That means life. Yeah, but, but you have to understand why are people quite uh, relaxed talking about it? It's because you know, we can still feel superior relative to these microbes. We are much more <laughs> intelligent than they are. But imagine a situation where we would feel uh, that we found a piece of equipment far more <laughs> than AI, that is far more sophisticated than us, outsmarts us. You know, we might need our AI systems to interpret their AI systems. And it's just like relying on your kids to explain to you something you find on the internet because they're much more computer savvy. Wow. Uh, sir, can I ask you this? Um, no. Wh when we talk, shut up, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> when, we talk... <laughs> when we talk about 
something more intelligent uh, or us being inferior to, to something uh, outside of uh, our planet. Uh, this is something the DOD, the, 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 the American DOD has been noticing for 80 years in uh, planet Earth uh, skies. Now, um, when you take that information, and of course, you know, there's not enough science behind uh, those uh, observings. But do you believe, and of course, you, you elaborated on that with the, the Uamuma. Uamuma. <laughs> I'm going to write a rock song. By the way. <laughs> yeah. a -mu -a -mu Just call hey, it baby. the O object. <laughs> the O object. Thank you. Thank you for saving me. It might be too late, though. But um, if you think about uh, extraterrestrial life, how do you feel about that? Do, do you think this is a reality or is it just a theory? Is it a thesis? Uh, how do you feel about uh, something intelligent, uh, you know, entering our skies. Well, um, so what I learned from decades of practicing astronomy is a sense of modesty uh, in the sense that uh, we better assume that what we find around us is not unique or special because at first, you know, Aristotle, the ancient Greek philosopher, argued that we are at the center of the universe. Everything is surrounding us in spheres you know that was a beautiful idea until copernicus and galileo realized well probably the earth is moving around the sun and we are not at the center and of course uh, galileo was put in house arrest <laughs> today he would be cancelled on social media uh, back then that's what they did to him uh, right. and um, uh, so that was the first instance where we realized you know we are not really at the center uh, and in fact, you know, we are born into this world like actors put on a stage. The first thing we notice from existing data is the stage is huge. You know, that's the size of the universe, which is 10 to the power 26 times bigger than our body. So we are certainly not at the center of the stage. The second thing is that play has been going on for 13.8 billion years since the Big Bang. We just came at the end. So yeah. the play is not about us. Forget about it. It's not about <laughs> us, despite what everyone thinks. Uh, and one way to figure out what the play is about is to find other actors. You know, that's what I'm talking about here. But uh, the 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 one thing that I think is extremely um, you know important in the context of um, searching uh, is to realize that we learn new th new facts over the past few years that, for example, Carl Sagan didn't know about. And what are the new facts? That uh, Earth-like planets, you know, uh, planets the size of the Earth, roughly at the same distance from their host uh, sun, uh, st sun-like star, are very common. You know, somewhere between a quarter and half of all the sun-like stars have a planet uh, the size of the Earth at the same separation. So. So um, not only we are not at the center of the universe, we are also, our backyard is not very different from tens of billions of other planets. To me, you know, that implies a sense of modesty that to say under similar circumstances, you get similar outcomes. And, you know, most of the stars from billions of years before the sun. So that means that things like us existed, predated us. And if you ask, Suppose you send the spacecraft uh, that are chemically propelled, like we send New Horizon or Voyager um, uh, out of the solar system. Suppose you send those, how quickly can you reach the outskirts of the Milky Way galaxy? It, you know, it takes much less than a billion years. Uh, and, and so in a billion years, you can imagine sending AI systems equipped with 3D printers that can replicate themselves on the surfaces of planets, oh. uh, out of the raw materials there, and you can pretty much visit every habitable planet what in the Milky called? Way galaxy. Now, it's true that perhaps nobody responded to our signals, radio signals, because it would take much more time. In fact, I, I just wrote a paper about this with my... Or they were just too primitive. No, no, no. Actually, if you do the calculation, that's a new paper that I've just written. If you do the calculation, you assume that Earth is not unusual. Uh, this is called the Copernican principle, that it's sort of typical. Uh, you find that it will take at least two millennia for a round trip uh, wow. signal uh, to, to make its way back to us as response. You know, So we send some radio signals 
starting a century ago, and it will take another thousand years before there will be a planet like us responding to our signal. And that's the, at the speed of light. If you imagine chemically propelled spacecraft to traverse those distances would take millions of years, you know, and we will not hear from them in the near future. So my point is, that doesn't mean that they are not here because they may have sent their probes long before we came to exist. It's not about right. us. We are not that significant. You know, we might be just like ants on a sidewalk. Uh, when you walk down the street, you don't pay attention to every ant. Now, Maybe. I have to, uh, I, sir, I have to ask you this. I'm sorry I interrupt you, but yeah. I have to ask you this. Um, you know, all of us have been interviewing Mr. Lou Elizondo, the leader of the ATIP program. Uh, I've, I've talked to uh, former Senator Harry Reid. Um, and this is my question to you. What is observed in our skies by the armed forces is something that does not have a propulsion system that seems to be using gravity as a uh, way of moving around, maneuvering, um, and for some, and, and somehow uh, is able to use gravity uh, and bend uh, time and space. For so, th this is what is being observed. This is the theory, th the theory that is being put out. Uh, by our armed forces and you know they're not scientists but this is what they observe um, I assume uh, you uh, have looked in to those uh, uh, witness accounts how do you feel about that you know these things we see without any propulsion system they're in space time in bubbles yeah 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 moves intelligently yeah yeah it's I would love to love to have your take on that yeah, as a physicist, I would say it's I, I'm very doubtful at these interpretations. And I'll tell you why. I mean, if these people are right, they should have gotten many Nobel Prizes. Uh, <laughs> because uh, so far, you know, we had a lot of laboratory experiments, a lot of data coming from the sky where the laws of physics, as we know them, were pretty much uh, accurate at describing what we see. And just realizing there is something that is disobeying the laws of physics by itself would be a huge revelation. You have to realize that the muon, some particle that is not really important for daily lives, uh, the muon has a slight deviation from a property that was calculated by very complex calculations. Uh, and it's not even clear that the theory predicts a uh, predicts something that is uh, away from what the data shows. And that's big news in physics, just this slight deviation in the magnetic moment of the muon. And this is just to illustrate to you that uh, the standard model of physics is tested so often, so much, that if there is an object that is producing phenomena that are in conflict with what we know, that would be huge news to the physics. Well, sir. Okay, the, the, but I'm the, saying, the, I'm saying, I'm saying, as a physicist, I until I collect the data that shows that, you know, I mean, there are two implications of such data. I'm not ruling it out in advance. I'm just saying uh, if we do find evidence for an extraterrestrial origin, that by itself would have a huge impact. But well, they, they're not they're not they're not arguing uh, that these things are defying whatever we know about phys f but physics. I think that's even bigger news. If right. we miss something about reality in the physics community. You have to understand that would be of much bigger impact because when you see a, a physical phenomena that... But sir, is, isn't, isn't this something you would like to look into? Of course, but I'm saying I'm doubtful because we tested known physics so often that uh, we haven't seen a deviation. But if, we, if it happens to be a deviation, I'm saying that would be even bigger news because it affects the way we understand the universe. You see, it's not just that these objects are behaving in a strange way. If physics is modified, it applies everywhere. Right. You so know, we the wouldn't... Of phys physics is yeah. the entire universe obeys the same laws of physics as we find in laboratories. And that to me is amazing because, you know, I would expect the universe to be chaotic, to be strange. You know, like when I every morning I, I look at the rooms of my daughters and they look like a mess. Right. <laughs> and, uh, why is the I, universe? I can organized? identify. Yeah. Why is the universe organized so well to obey the same laws of physics everywhere? Now you're telling me there might be objects that are revealing a new behavior we've never seen before. I say, well, let's let's look at them closely because that would have huge implications. Yes. Right.
Yeah, and, and we wouldn't be here just uh, casually discussing it. It'd be on the front page of the newspaper. Basically. Oh, no, it would be in many Nobel Prizes. Uh, yeah. Believe me, that would but have sir, a huge... Uh, I, 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 I have a very burning question. It's it's burning in my uh, the back of my throat right now. <laughs> um, and that is, what do we know uh, in science about gravity and manipulating gravity and, and using it as a propulsion system? Is there anything going on on that subject? Uh, no, gravity is the weakest force of all forces we have. Mm. And for propulsion, it's not really useful unless there is one caveat, unless you have, for example, a black hole close to you. And then when you come close to a black hole, you can get close to the speed of light. So you can imagine getting a, a, a kick or a boost uh, and then propelling yourself to very high speeds as a result of passing close to a black hole or two black holes orbiting. And that happens in nature. Actually, I wrote a paper talking about stars that are moving through the universe. As we speak, there are stars moving through the universe at the speed of light because uh, they came close to two black holes at the centers of galaxies. And just like in a pinball machine, you know, they were kicked out close to the speed of light. So there is a whole population of stars moving through the universe at the speed of light that originated from this uh, gravitational boost uh, that we were talking about from uh, uh, and and uh, so that is possible but but otherwise you know manipulating space and time in a way that will give you a propulsion that's a highly speculative idea and, and i don't see a simple way of doing that uh, i got a quick question for you yeah um, i've heard a theory about like electromagnetic like slip sheets basically making these things move I, do you know what i'm talking about at all by chance oh uh, <laughs> yeah that's fine <laughs> um well let me ask you this do you think the sun has a neutron a neutronian core the sun no mm -hmm. we pretty much know what the sun is made of because or no earth sorry yeah earth um, also for Earth, we have, a, a, you know, we have information about what's going on in the core of the Earth. You know, if it, if it had neutrons in the core, uh, you know, we would, first of all, neutrons are unstable uh, unless you pack uh, Proton, enough right? of them that would make an object the mass of the sun, roughly, or, uh, oh. you know, a little more than the sun. It's called a neutron star. But as long as you have chunks of neutrons with a smaller mass than that, they will decay within 10 minutes, typically. Uh, and so it's impossible <laughs> to have neutrons making a substantial component of Earth because Earth is much less massive than the sun. But, um, you know, also we have data about um, uh, acoustic waves, you know, seismic noise that comes from the Earth, which allows us to infer the composition of the Earth. And it's mostly rock uh, made of iron and other elements and heavy elements. And by the way, I should tell you an anecdote that uh, about 100 years ago, uh, people thought that the sun is made of the same elements as the earth. That was the prevailing view. And there was a, a student doing a PhD thesis, the first PhD thesis in astronomy at Harvard, uh, at Harvard Radcliffe. Uh, her name was Cecilia Payne Kapashkin. And she realized that based on the, uh, the analysis of uh, the light that comes from the surface of the sun, that in fact the sun is made mostly, or the surface of the sun is made mostly of hydrogen. So she made this statement: the sun is the surface of the sun is made mostly of hydrogen in her PhD defense. And it was uh, one of the members of um, uh, the examining examining team, the, the uh, people that were examining her, uh, was uh, the director of the Princeton University Observatory, a very dis the most distinguished astronomer at the time, Henry Norris Russell. And he said, no, you should take out this statement because we all know that the sun is made of the same elements as the earth. Hmm. And she, you know, first of all, was a woman and also was uh, early in her career and she took it out. But right. then he wanted to prove her wrong. So he went out and collected data about the sun. And a few years later, wrote a paper saying that she was right. And by the way, that was a major discovery. Mm -hmm. She should have gotten the Nobel Prize for sure, because wow. we now know that not only the sun is made mostly of hydrogen, but most of the universe is hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And it's because of the Big Bang, you know, that so we understand where it comes from. But she was the, the one to discover it. And she was a chair of the astronomy department at Harvard.
that you know and wow. she also lived where i live in the same suburb of boston and uh so she was quite a, a, an amazing uh, uh, scientist uh, sir very sweet um <coughs> we have a donation by shen <coughs> thank you for your support and um the question is albuquerque drive i don't know what that really means <laughs> do you know no i don't know what is <laughs> <laughs> he takes it so well question though. mark get that all the time I've yeah got, uh, i've got a quick question <laughs> well professor. you know the privilege of being a scientist is when you don't know something you can just say i don't know in other <laughs> professions like being a politician you would never hear a politician saying right. i don't know i mean because you would lose your support but as a scientist if i don't know He's i don't be know. honest yeah <laughs> that's just honest maybe yeah. uh, shen you can elaborate on that a little bit and i'll uh, put your question in the feed i just have a quick question about a more more and um, apologies for this might be information that i should be aware of but the trajectory and the path that the object took and it's now moved has it moved out of our solar system yet um well it's on its way uh, it's now a, a million times fainter than it was close to the sun wow. and then um, it, it it's taking its uh, time to to leave the solar system because it takes 10,000 years for it to yeah. uh, enter the solar system and now leave it so it's a long time and just think about us 10,000 years ago we weren't that interesting and uh, we were <laughs> like animals more or less i mean un indistinguishable from animals i would say 10,000 years ago and um, clearly this object did not enter the solar system because of us yeah. you know there was a habitable planet the earth and perhaps there were probes on it uh so the but it's not because of us and as i say all the time you know we shouldn't think that we are major players in the in this play that is going on. We are spectators, and we forget that we should watch the sky in order to figure out what the play is about. No, that's great. My question was then going to lead on to whether you were still gathering data from it just to keep getting more and more information. We cannot uh, do that because it's too faint right yeah. now. But but we uh, will monitor the sky for more objects of the same. Of you know, we just found it within a few years of surveying the sky. So uh, there is a Vera Rubin Observatory uh, that will start operations in two years and m much more sensitive than uh, pan stars and could discover an Oumuamua-like object every month. Is that the one in Chile? Is it Chile? Is it in Chile, Vera in Chile, exactly. Yeah. And the Galileo yeah. project, part of it would be also to develop the software that will help uh, analyze the data coming from uh, uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory and, and then maybe plan on sending a spacecraft that will take a close up photograph of the next object. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Are you ever in awe of our capabilities? Our? Yeah. Um, Human. No, because I think they will be far greater in the future. So I, <laughs> I you know, we are <laughs> yeah. we not toddlers, uh, technologically speaking. We started a, a hundred years ago. I, I'm, I, I'm never proud of uh, what we accomplished because it, it has been accomplished only over a hundred years. And, and, and you look yeah. at the technologies, they're evolving exponentially on a few years time scale. In fact, AI is evolving even faster on a single year time scale. So just yeah. You know, 10 years into the future, we will have self-driving cars. We will have uh, AI systems deciding what kind of uh, medical treatment you will get. And uh, I'm not at all clear that the future belongs to us as biological creatures. It might well be that we will be outsmarted by AI systems. Yeah. Sir, uh, I, have a, <laughs> I, have a, I have another question uh, about uh, the Israeli <laughs> space program. Mm -hmm. um, which uh, was led by Mr. Chaim Eshed. Um, now, Mr. Eshed uh, dropped a biography and he said some wild things. And I'm sure you know about that. Um, so for the viewers, uh, Mr. Eshed led the Israeli space program for many decades. Uh, he's a very known and immaculate uh, military officer. Uh, officer and um, but he said a lot too and he said uh, he heard I think uh, like in third it was anecdotal uh, that there was more knowledge about human beings being in contact with uh, ET beings or something <laughs> now what do you think about that as an Israeli scientist yeah well uh, I, let me just emphasize the word uh, scientist not Israeli uh, but uh, as a scientist, um, I would say 
there are lots of people that claim that they are Napoleon. <laughs> now, uh, you ask them, okay, uh, show me your ID. You look at the ID and it doesn't say Napoleon. What do you right. do with these people? Okay. Uh, so my point is you have to rely on evidence. <laughs> and he did not show any document or any directive. I'm not saying he's wrong. I'm just saying whoever, the journalist that covered the story, that broke the story, right. did not do his job. He should have not covered the story unless there was evidence. Right. That's all right. Great point. Yeah. True, true. Anytime. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Anthony Sargon, thank you for your support. Uh, he has a question, Professor Loeb. Uh, will you be looking at any past UFO cases for historical context or comparing data? Uh, thank you for your work and best of luck, sir. Thank you. So, you should think of me as the same kid that grew up in, a, in, in on a farm. Uh, I, People that know me from that time would argue that I'm still the same person. I, I didn't change much. And I'm very proud of that because, you know, the one thing that characterizes a kid is that the kid never listens to what the adults say. You know, the kid, the, if the adults <laughs> say something is this, the kid wants to see it for himself or herself. So the kid put, puts usually skin in the game, just gets bruised when, you know, doing the wrong thing. But at least the kid learns something new out of the experience on his own or her own. So in my case, I just want to get the data. That's all. And I'm glad that there are people supporting this research. I want to get my data, not data that the government gave me, not data from the past. You know, there is this biblical story about Abraham uh, mm -hmm. sacrificing uh, his own, try, you know, being asked to sacrifice his own son, uh, Isaac, after hearing the voice of God, telling him, instructing him to do that. Now, if Abraham had a cell phone with a voice memo up, he could have pressed the button and recorded the voice of God. And we would all listen to that recording and say, oh yeah, someone spoke. Uh, but he didn't have a, a, a voice memo up at the time. And then we have to decide, do we believe that story or not? And by the way, God would get sued. <laughs> I don't <My> want <laughs> uh, to rely on stories. I want <laughs> to see it and analyze it in an open way so that anyone else can reproduce what I did. Sure. So otherwise, what are we doing here, right? We could. Uh, otherwise, if you can't wrap it up, if you can't close it with that hard evidence, you can't prove anybody wrong, right? Or right, right? You know. So it's yeah. like it takes what, yeah what you're doing and and others to to actually get that proof so that we can move on with our lives and exactly and no that's the exactly next the point you see the the way that the scientists react to that is saying dismissing it you know ridiculing it saying until you bring me extraordinary evidence i don't want to discuss it but uh, it's it's a catch because if you are not funding the search you would never discover that extraordinary mm -hmm. evidence so you know it's just like saying until you show me that the dark matter is weakly interacting massive particles i will not fund it which is not the approach that scientists took. It's not the approach. They funded it. They didn't find it, by the way. Um, wow. so my point is, you have to fund the search in order to claim that there is no extraordinary evidence. Otherwise, oh, wow. it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, yeah. and if you, it's like what, like just anything you do in life, I, I approach with extreme vigor, and I take it seriously. Because in the end, I don't want to look back and say, I didn't give it everything you right know? it's kind right. of the same but yeah. think about this question which i call in my book um, i call it omuamua's wager i say just like pascal you know had a wager about god he said well either god exists or doesn't but we should take the possibility that god exists seriously because the implications are huge and i say we should take the possibility that omuamua the o object max uh, <laughs> was technological in origin because the implications would be huge. We can't just dismiss it and move on business as usual. Mm. Wonderful. Well, th uh, sir, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Avi Loeb, uh, I don't think we should take any more of your time. Toda uh, Rabba. Um, and uh, I hope... Uh, you know, you will be back uh, on on my podcast, or maybe my buddies uh, Vinny and uh, Sean. Anytime, anytime. Uh, and you'll and, be uh, the first to know if we find something. 
Awesome, awesome. Let's put it this way. Uh, by the way, Steven Spielberg asked me to notify him first, but uh, I will give you um, higher priority. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That's and by the, the doors poster. And and by <laughs> the way, <laughs> if Stephen wants to be on my podcast, you know, twisting my arm, but he can be on. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Loeb, can you maybe uh, plug just one more time what tomorrow uh, is going to be happening uh, with the Galileo project? Uh, please plug your books, whatever is going on. Let's go. Uh, so tomorrow, uh, Monday, July 26th, at uh, noon Eastern time in the US, there would be a press uh, conference discussing the Galileo project. And it, uh, if you just Google the Galileo project at Harvard uh, and my name, you will be able to find it. And under news and events, you can find the links to YouTube and uh, Facebook uh, where you can watch it uh, live. Uh, the other thing is, uh, all of this started uh, six months ago when I published my book, Extraterrestrial, uh, which is translated to 25 languages. So you can look for it in your own language. Um, and um, I very much hope you will enjoy it, where I discuss much of the same that we discussed in this program. Uh, I also have a weekly commentary uh, in Scientific American, and uh, uh, all these commentaries are listed on my website at Harvard University, which you can find by Googling my name, Avi Loeb. It will be in the in the feed on the YouTube page uh, of this episode. And um, sir, um, you're doing incredible work. Um, I'm going to be following you extensively. Uh, I think all of us, uh, I see our viewers are so excited. And, uh, you know, we're going to watch tomorrow. And uh, yeah, I'm wagging my tail. Well, so thank you. And, really. and if you ever visit the Boston area, you're invited to jog with me at 5 a.m. Yes. Look, hey, I'll be doing push ups up at 4. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's not lying. <laughs> okay, sir. Thank you so much for taking time for us. And, uh, you know, it was amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Truly Professor. Thanks for being honor. Um, toda raba. Toda, Max. Uh, Later. Later. Bye. 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 Bye.